Welcome to the third episode of Destiny Physics, where we take random sh** in Destiny and apply basic, real-world physics to it for fun, to see if we can squeeze out some interesting factoids. After the first two videos in this series, a lot of you commented leaving ideas on where to take it next, and every one of them were totally great and not dumb at all. But instead of doing any of that, I'm going to be doing something completely different. No! I was already gonna do that, demonic doggy! It was my idea first, you can't have it! Mom. So yeah, today I want to talk about how sparkly the sparkle fingers are. To be more specific, what is the voltage of a Stormcaller Super, and how quickly could it charge, or more likely destroy, your phone? So strap in, because today we're looking at the dark side. There is one main concept that we'll be using to find the storm collar voltage, and that is the breakdown voltage of air. So let's do a breakdown of what that means. Lightning is a good example of this concept. Normally, air is a great insulator, meaning it doesn't allow electricity to flow through it easily. This is because all of the electrons in its outer shell, you may recall this from your chemistry class being called the valence band, do not overlap with the conduction band. It has what we call a band gap, and all the electrons are stuck in the valence band and cannot jump this band gap. Whereas in metals such as copper wire, the conduction band and valence bands overlap, so the outer electrons can move relatively freely between atoms. So basically, in insulators, electrons can't move, and in conductors, they can. And since electricity at the most simple level is just the flow of electrons, this means copper is a good conductor. Again, in normal conditions, air is not that. However, in the case of lightning, the voltage difference between the clouds and the ground builds so high that eventually all that energy begins to rip some of those electrons free, ionizing the air and creating a plasma. This creates a pathway from the clouds to the ground, where electricity can flow. Imagine that pathway is like a wire. No, really, go ahead, imagine it. You got it? Okay, good, H hold that, and we'll be coming back to it in a bit. Now that the electricity has a place to go, the ground, all of that built-up charge flows freely, creating what we call an arc, and <laughs> lightning strikes. This is the same concept we can use to understand how the storm trance super works. All we need to do is find out how high the voltage has to be in order to bridge the gap between ourselves and the victim guardian at the maximum distance it's possible, and that will tell us the voltage of our super. So to do this, we can use the so-called Passion's Law. I'm gonna be honest with you, this formula is just gross. A natural log function within another natural log function? Th those are the LN bits? Yuck. Typically, for air, this breakdown voltage is quoted to be about 3 megavolts per meter. But let's go through each of the variables to see what's happening here. First off, we have P, which is just the air pressure. For this, we can use the standard atmospheric pressure, i.e. the air pressure you're sitting in right now when you're watching this video which is one atmosphere, or 101.325 kilopascals. Next, we have D, which is just the distance the arc has to travel. We can measure this in-game as the distance between the storm caller's hands and the victim. Finally, we have A, B, and gamma. Gamma is a little squiggly one at the bottom. These are all constants that are exclusive to this equation, and they're related to such things as the ionization potential, the ionization cross-section, and the secondary emission coefficient. If none of that made sense to you, don't worry, they're just numbers that we can look up. Except, no they aren't. I don't know if anyone else will care about this or not, but I'm gonna go on a quick rant. See, most of the literature on breakdown voltages quotes values for A, B, and gamma as you see on the screen. However, this is usually done for very small distances, like in the millimeter or micrometer range, and those constants are dependent on the ratio between electric field and pressure. So even though the Wikipedia entry gives these values for the constants, I'm not certain that they're correct for our case. 
So, I found a paper that discusses lightning in particular and gives constants for the longer arc distances, but these don't agree with the ones in the other papers. So when I look up the source that they cited, surprise head, it's fucking class notes. Class notes are not a scholarly source. All that is beside the fact that the notes didn't even give the values for the constants. How did this paper get published? This is from the same university as the human vaporization pork paper? Well, why am I not surprised? Well, probably because this was actually some undergrad's report. So that makes sense, but now I just feel like shit. Another source I found uses the commonly cited values, but when you plug those in, they don't agree with the voltage of three megavolts for one meter. So what the hell? And every other freaking source I could find was either from some book published in the 1930s or from another entry-level college physics textbook. Again, not scholarly sources, except, oops, it actually looks like the three megavolts per meter number was really for small gaps. For larger gaps, it's closer to 2.2 to 2.4 megavolts per meter, which when you plug in the wiki values does match up. So after all that, after multiple days of looking into this, I'm just back to square one. So what did I learn from all this? What was the meaning of it all? I don't know. And now I think that the guy who was helping me do these calculations thinks that I'm crazy because I couldn't stop messaging him about all this, which is probably okay because I think I am going crazy. Maybe I just need a Xanax. Maybe I should have done something else with my life. <sighs> so once I had a breather and calmed down for a few minutes, I got back to work. Turns out the values on the wiki are correct. Since we can just use those same constants, and we know the atmospheric pressure, all we have to do is find the maximum distance at which the storm trance can kill a person to get the voltage. To do that, I had to once again lure a couple friends into a private match and watch with glee and maniacal laughter as they killed themselves over and over again. It was very cathartic after all of that. To find this distance, I just had to get one of the guardians to stand still and the other activate their super and very slowly inch toward the victim. Notice here in the footage how they don't instantly vaporize and how it looks like the electrical power is delivered in two distinct pulses. The first one lingers for a bit but doesn't seem to do much. The next one comes in and quickly kills the guardian. We can use that in a bit. Next, I used the average human height that I found in the Golden Gun video, hint, freaking hint, go watch that one if you haven't, which is about 1.7 meters, and used that to find the conversion factor, which is about 100 pixels per meter. Then I just had to find the number of pixels between the two guardians and divide by this conversion factor, and there we have it. Going in, I thought this distance would be a couple or maybe a few meters. Nope, almost 11. 11 meters. That is a huge arc. So I repeated this a few times just to make sure my measurements were accurate, and the average distance was 11.15 meters. Now we just have to plug all of this lovely mess into the Passion's Law equation, and there we have it. The voltage of a storm trance super is about 20.86 megavolts, or about 21 million volts. This is just under the largest man-made voltage ever at 25 megavolts, created using a Van de Graaff machine, which exploits some properties of static electricity, and it's huh, quite a bit less than a typical lightning bolt, which is about 100 megavolts. But thinking about it, it does make sense. Lightning obeys the same principle, but travels much, much farther and only lasts a fraction of the time. And besides that, voltage doesn't tell us the whole picture. No, for that, we need the current. To find the current, we can use the simple power relation of P equals IV, or power equals current times voltage. This gives the power in a simple circuit. Remember how I told you that we can think of the lightning path as a wire? Well, we can think of this whole system as a simple circuit connected from the storm caller to the victim, which acts as our ground and find the power contained within the strike. Not only that, but we know that the storm trance dissociates the victim in the same way that the golden gun does. And if you remember from the last video, power is just energy divided by time. And we know the energy required to dissociate a human, it was 2.99 billion joules. Seriously, go watch that video if you haven't, I'll wait. So we have the energy, we have the voltage, we're looking for the current, all we need is the time. 
We can find this time required by looking back at our footage and counting the frames between when the victim is hit with the first pulse of the storm trance and when the second pulse stops acting on him. which is about 54 frames total for this first trial. At 60 frames per second, one frame is about 0.0167 seconds. So we just multiply that by the 54 and we get 0.9 seconds for the total duration. We're doing it this way rather than waiting for the full dissociation as we did in the last video, because at this point for the storm trance, all of the energy has been transferred from the storm trance guardian and has been absorbed by the victim. After that, it's more of a situation. But just to be safe, I had my friends kill each other over and over again to get an average time. Just to be safe, no other reason. But it was actually a good idea because this seemed fairly variable. Here is a table of the results and the average time was 0.999 seconds, but we can just say one second is close enough. So now we can just solve for current, which is 134.34 amps. That's pretty high, not super high, but for example, an average incandescent bulb will pull less than one amp of current. And the 2080 Ti I'm currently using in my computer to record all of this uses less than 30 amps of current. However, it's still actually a lot less current than a lightning strike, which can be as high as 30 kiloamps. But again, you have to remember that lightning lasts far shorter than a storm trance pulse. A typical lightning stroke only lasts about 60 to 70 microseconds or 0.00006 seconds. That's very short compared to the storm trance's 0.5 seconds per pulse. Just for reference, we can plug this current back into the power equation to find the power of the storm trance strike and we get 2.99 gigawatts. And yes, it's the same exact number as the energy, just different units, because it takes exactly one second for the strike to propagate. So now we finally have enough information to answer the question, how long would it take for a storm trance to charge your phone? So we know the current of the storm trance, but what's the amperage of your average phone charger? Well, standard charging is about 2.4 amps and fast chargers operate between three and 3.5. That is, a lot less than 134. Your phone charger can typically supply more current than a phone can accept, but the voltage and current will both be reduced because of Ohm's law, and so you usually won't break the device. Here, since we have to have this large voltage to create the long arc we see, we can't really reduce the voltage, so the current will just destroy the phone like it does us. Maybe if you had a really large, really high wattage resistor, bigger than anything I've ever seen, it might be possible, but I digress. Is that too much of a cop out? Well, okay, let's just say theoretically, how could it be done? Well, current is just the charge passing through some cross section per unit time, or coulombs per second, coulomb being the unit of charge. So if we knew how much charge an average phone could store, we could find out how long you'd have to give it the Princess Sparkles treatment to fully charge it. It looks like the iPhone 12 has a capacity of 3,687 milliamp hours, which converts to about 13,273 coulombs of charge. So we can just take this definition of current and solve for time which gives us an answer of about one minute and 33 seconds. Thus, the storm trance could transfer enough charge to fill up your iPhone 12 in about one and a half minutes. Seems like a lot? Well, keep in mind that the average lightning strike only transfers about 15 coulombs of charge total. So it would take over a thousand lightning strikes to charge your phone. Granted, by the end of all this, your phone, the hand holding it, and the rest of you would be completely disintegrated. Now that's what I call wireless charging. So for my patrons, I'm gonna make a table with a bunch of the most common phones. 
So if you don't have an iPhone 12 and you want to find out exactly how long it would take to charge your phone, or if you just want to help me make more videos like this one, you can join the fine people on the screen right now who are already donating to my Patreon. And with your help, hopefully I can one day turn this weird hobby into my actual job. And if you like this video, please take a moment to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and maybe share it with a friend. All of it really helps out a lot. I plan on making more of these in the near future, and the next one should be much simpler to follow. It'll be looking at the yeet force of a Cabal drop pod. So, I hope you guys had as much fun watching this video as I had making it. Until next time, Guardians.